Um, we had a really nice introduction of our speaker this morning, uh, so I'm going to keep this brief. Dr. Reichick is uh, clearly one of the preeminent pediatric cardiologists uh, of our time. He's the Associate uh, Chief of Cardiology at CHOP. He is um, the director of the fetal heart program there, and uh, he is a founding member and director of the Forward Clinic, uh, which is uh, their Fontan uh, program. And uh, we had a tremendous uh, lecture this morning, Grand Rounds, given an overview of uh, Fontan care. And after that, it was pretty much a feeding frenzy for his time, uh, which is why we're, we're a few minutes late here. So I apologize to the people online for the late start, but uh, we just couldn't, couldn't come to an end. Um, this afternoon, uh, we are going to go into more depth about Fontan associated liver disease, and I'm very uh, pleased that uh, our friend and colleague, Dr. Henry Lin, has a, uh, agreed to uh, join in the conversation. One of the key things um, that was reiterated during um, our learnings today was that it takes a village to take care of these patients, and uh, I do want to um, show my appreciation for the Fontan team that we have here, uh, and I would say, you know, there's many programs uh, in the nations that still don't have this, many programs that are much bigger than we are, and I'm extremely grateful to all the people on this team, uh, first and foremost to Kara Sheena and Maggie Likes who lead this team, uh, but also their um, absolutely uh, uh, important members, Annie Stone from Pulmonology, Henry Lynn from Gastroenterology Hepatology, Emily Olson from Neuropsych, Alyssa Tortorich uh, for Nutrition, uh, Katie Lee from Social Work, and then obviously uh, our nursing support, and uh, more recently, sorry, I don't have a picture yet, Maggie Dazzler uh, for Pharmacy. So uh, this is a, a fantastic effort, and I'm very grateful uh, to that. Before I hand over the mic to our speaker, I do want to uh, give a big shout out to Ashley Harrison who essentially uh, did all the legwork, pulled this all off, uh, and is really the mastermind behind uh, today's day and visit. Uh, so uh, a big hand of applause. <laughs> and uh, with that, uh, I'm excited to uh, go to this session. In case you're wondering what the chairs are for, there will be a little fireside chat that we have to after a uh, didactic introduction to the topic by uh, Dr. Reichick. Jack. Well, th thank you so much, uh, Lars. And uh, yes, thank you as well to, uh, to Ashley for her fantastic uh, coordination of the day, a uh, very busy day, which was fantastic. It was great to meet um, so many folks and uh, some uh, wonderful case presentations this afternoon. Um, all very st stimulating and uh, um, sobering to the extent that um, we know that there are still some shared challenges. Um, you know, if there were answers, we wouldn't be having these discussions. Um, but we, uh, we know there's a lot more work to be done uh, to improve outcomes for these patients. So what I'm going to do, uh, I think, should take me about 45 minutes or so, and then we can have a nice conversation, discussion, um, some input from uh, the audience, is to focus in on the liver. Now, uh, let me freely admit uh, disclosure here, I am not a hepatologist, uh, and much of what I've learned actually about the liver comes, comes from Henry uh, and some of his colleagues uh, uh, at CHOP, but sort of taken a, a bit of a dive into this particular organ system, and um, what I'm trying to do also, I think probably the most important thing I want to share in my, uh, in my talk is um, identification of what the questions are, and the ongoing research uh, that's underway and how we're beginning to think about approaching uh, this particular uh, situation, this condition. So liver disease in patients with single ventricle, the what, the how, and the why. Uh, we spent a fair amount of time today talking about a number of different challenges. And I thought I would actually start this discussion about the liver with um, a bit of optimism. Uh, from the perspective, and again, it depends on how you're going to look at what I'm about to say here, whether it's optimistic or, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got some big challenges coming up here. But 
This was work done, again, we've mentioned it a couple of times, New Zealand, Australia Registry, a paper that was published in Heart in 2020, where they looked at over 800 individuals over the age of 16 and stratified these 800 patients with single ventricle Fontan based on whether there were risk factors or no risk factors. And these were the risk factors that they identified. So presence of sustained arrhythmia, thromboembolism, lymphatic insufficiency, more than a moderate degree of ventricular dysfunction or AV valve regurge. About a third of the 800 patients had high risk, two thirds did not. And then they got a bunch of actuarial scientists to sit in a room and I don't understand actuarial science at all, but apparently it's this magical way of predicting who's going to survive and for how long, and the life insurance folks do this all the time. Uh, and then they did that for the Fontaine group. And here's what they came up with. They modeled actuarial survival for the lowest patients absent these particular outcomes out to age 60, and with a pessimistic and a conservative and an optimistic projection. According to their projections, two-thirds of patients without these risk factors will be alive at age 60, which I found, you know, just mind-boggling. So again, uh, is this optimism or is this, oh my gosh, uh, Craig's going to need to hire, you know, 30 more people uh, to, you know, uh, manage this? Um, not every one of these patients is going to need a heart transplant. Are they going to have liver issues? Yeah, most likely. To what magnitude? We don't yet know. But um, we are facing probably uh, a, an explosion of need for care for this growing, rapidly growing population of patients. Okay. So the what that relates to the liver. Uh, it was this paper, as best as I can tell, back in 2005, which was a report in uh, JTCVS by a uh, Johns Hopkins um, medical student uh, at the time uh, and his uh, hepatology attending that reported on liver pathology in patients undergoing the Fontan and first reported uh, a, the initial case of hepatocellular cellular carcinoma in like a 20-year-old. Um, and it was not, interestingly, you know, you think, uh, you know, this has always been a problem, we've been talking about this, but up until this point, there was no mention of a liver issue <laughs> in fine. It wasn't on, on the radar screen at all. Uh, let alone today, we say, oh, you know, patients are, are some patients are aware, some physicians are, are not aware you know, of this, but this really introduced the problem. Um, and it was a report of nine patients, some of who died a few hours after the Fontan, some uh, up to 18 years after the Fontan, <clears throat> and they looked at their pathology specimens uh, and reported the very first case of hepatocellular carcinoma. Fast forward to where we are today, um, and what I'm going to show you is our current understanding demonstrating the what and then go into some of the research that I think can answer some of these, some of the questions of the, of the how and why. The liver is that first organ that sits right underneath the heart. This is how I explain it to families as to why we're interested and focused on the liver. Whatever's going on in the heart, whatever's going on in the Fontan pathway is being transmitted directly into the vascular system of the liver, which sits right underneath it. The liver is a very, very vascular organ. And therefore, what do we see, not surprisingly, sinusoidal dilation, congestion, and then in the blue here, bands of fibrosis extending from the central veins towards the sinusoids. And that's the typical appearance. So this is a fancy slide that reflects what do we see, okay, and how do we see these things. Here's what we see. Uh, it's a grab bag of terms and findings that I'm going to list here from what is most common to least common and decrease in frequency. What is most common, and in fact present in every single patient with a Fontan? There is liver fibrosis. We have been biopsying patients uh, for over 10 years, and uh, as part of general surveillance, there is no patient with a Fontan that doesn't have some degree of fibrosis. 
So they all have that. Now, again, different tests give you a different sense of how much there might be, but if you look at the tissue, they're all going to have fibrosis. What else do we see? In the vast, vast majority, very commonly, some form of abnormal liver enzymes and some degree of stiffness when you look at their livers using elastography techniques. As time progresses, you'll see a low platelet count, abnormal liver imaging, the presence of focal nodular hyperplasia. We'll show you some examples of that here in a moment. Ultimately, then, liver cirrhosis. And then the least common but the most concerning are challenges in relation to hepatocellular carcinoma. And the fact that if you don't pick up on the HCC quickly enough, this is a lethal condition. So let's look at some images, starting with uh, various tools that we have to assess what the liver looks like. So contrast enhanced CT. Uh, and here's an image of a liver. Let's use my arrow showing up there. Yeah. Uh, with um, a very uh, classic reticular pattern that's consistent with the presence of broad scars. Another patient with contrast-enhanced CT in the venous phase, we see an irregular nodular liver surface and the presence of perigastric varices and some splenomegaly. Now, what's interesting is, important to note even at this point, uh, unlike liver disease in non-Fontan patients, it's less common to see problems with varices. It's not that patients don't have varices at all. But if you think about what a, a varix does in a patient with liver with portal hypertension, it's to decompress that system into a low-pressure state, into the venous system. Well, the venous system is the problem here, <laughs> the central venous hypertension. So there's no place for these collateral vessels, these varices, to uh, decompress into. And so therefore, varices is not as big of a problem uh, in the Fontan liver as it is in non-Fontan liver disease. Here's another patient with contrast-enhanced CT in the arterial phase. And what the arrow is pointing to are three large areas of arterialization or focal nodular hyperplasia. These are areas, again, that uh, light up in the arterial phase. There is increased arterial flow to these regions on uh, other imaging modalities, perhaps on ultrasound, they might be confused with HCC. And I'll show you an example of what HCC looks like here in a moment. Uh, but these are relatively common. They occur in more, in more of our adolescent patients. Um, why are these occurring? The general thinking here is that because the fibrosis that we see surrounds the central veins and the central veins are tense and congested and engorged, they are altering regional blood flow in the peri-central vein region, and that's what draws arterial blood from the liver to those regions, typically most affected in the watershed periphery regions of the liver. And once you get enough of that arterialization to that region, you end up with this appearance on the CT. So again, it's it's thought to be related to initially decreased perfusion in the central lobular region and then arterialization to that area. Arterialization is a big problem for all of our Fontan patients, be it into the lungs or, or into the liver as well. I'm going to show you some interesting data uh, that looks at uh, MR-derived flow in the IVC as a consequence of arterialization. Uh, another set of images using MR techniques, um, looking at uh, a host of things that are different uh, in these livers. And so just to quickly point out, we have uh, an MR here showing reticular enhancement. Uh, and some progressive of that reticular enhancement here in um, this patient. In C, we have areas of, quote, cloud-like enhancement in the right hepatic lobe with a relative sparing of the left lobe. Kind of interesting. The entire condition of Fontan-associated liver disease appears to be uh, heterogeneous, not just on a cellular you know, histological level, but various lobes of the liver can be spared. 
And in image D, we have severe enhancement with large areas of focally diminished enhancement consistent with, uh, with uh, significant congestion and fibrosis. And here are some more images. Um, this, I, I've lifted this from a, a Japanese paper from not too long ago, which did sort of a side-by-side -side comparison of the difference between focal nodular hyperplasia and the appearance of HCC, which on surface inspection might look the same, but there are particular ways of distinguishing the two. So for focal nodular hyperplasia, they're going to light up on, uh, in the arterial phase, usually in the watershed peripheral regions, as you see here. And this is a case of HCC. You see right here, same patient with uh, growth of the tumor over a time interval. And if you look at these different uh, uh, clips here, clip C versus clip D, and here's where I'll, I'll, I'll uh, recruit some input from our hepatologist. There's something about uh, your ISO intensity versus hyperintensity that distinguishes HCC from focal nodular hyperplasia. I think it's uh, ISO intense on a particular set of sequences and then uh, hyper intense on some other set of sequences. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, in, if you're suspicious, if you see nodules uh, in the liver on MR, um, doing uh, um, contrast enhancement and utilizing a variety of these sequences can help distinguish what is a benign finding of FNH from what could be uh, an early hepatocellular carcinoma. So that's what we see on our imaging uh, modalities. What does the liver tissue actually look like? Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of that. And uh, here are some images again from two patients, one with uh, focal nodular hyperplasia and this nutmeg appearance to the right lobe of the liver. And your typical appearance, and I've sort of listed here just a little bit of the characteristics of this patient, which is your typical, well, 18-year-old heterotaxy with a PA pressure that's quite favorable uh, at a pressure of 10. But yet, if you look at the, the degree of fibrosis, which is in blue here, it's quite substantial. One of the challenges in uh, characterizing the magnitude of liver fibrosis in this disease is the fact that it's both central and portal fibrosis, and that most of the classic uh, schema for identifying and stratifying severity of fibrosis is based on either one or the other, uh, and therefore trying to assess the magnitude of fibrosis in Fontan patients can be challenging. Here's a, an example of a 20-year-old male with a Fontan circulation with the presence of sinusoidal dilatation and bands of fibrosis that are extending from the central vein along out towards the sinusoid. So here's a central vein, and you see all of this blue making its way out from the central vein into the, uh, into the liver periphery. Here's an example of a, uh, of a biopsy, uh, and this is actually one of our patients uh, from a couple of years back with expanded fibrotic portal tracts and fibrosis surrounding sinusoids and a broad scar up here uh, on the right side of the picture, extending throughout, pretty much throughout the piece of tissue that we see here. Here's uh, uh, something from one of our patients as well, which uh, just in the back of all of our minds needs to uh, maintain the notion that perhaps not all of this is fully related just to Fontan circulation. Uh, here's a, uh, a sample uh, at a 40 magnification of a two-year-old who died just the next day after uh, her Fontan, uh, and there was extensive portal fibrosis that was seen in this liver. Now, that could not have all happened in one day, obviously. So this is a patient who came to the Fontan with some degree of, uh, of liver involvement already, and that's likely the case to some degree in many of our patients. And then there's the work that, that uh, Henry and uh, Pierre Russo and, and um, uh, others brought uh, to our attention that helped us to uh, 
both combine portal uh, and central fibrosis into a uh, judgment of uh, comprehensive magnitude of fibrotic change in any particular piece of tissue. Uh, once we had decided as a group that we were going to start routinely biopsying all of our Fontan patients, which is what we did back in about 2012, uh, in conjunction with a cardiac cath and an MRI, uh, we also needed to have some systematic way in which we were going to gauge the magnitude of fibrosis. And so the serious red made the most sense um, to our group uh, and does give you a uh, idea of the total burden uh, magnitude of fibrosis that's present in any piece of tissue. And you come up with a percentage. So here you see 17% collagen deposition, 31% or 41% collagen deposition. And this technique allowed us to explore a variety of different uh, potential associations, uh, both clinically and on MR study. So the initial paper uh, was, came out by uh, Lee Surrey with Henry as the uh, senior author, uh, a series of um, about 70 patients that had their biopsies at almost age 18. Central lobular and sinusoidal fibrosis was seen in all, with 39% being high grade. Portal fibrosis in over 90%, 36% being high grade, utilizing some of these other techniques, right? So we're sort of presenting a relatively new way of doing something. This is one of the challenges when you introduce something new, you have to use old techniques to interpret it in some manner. Uh, and so here you see um, the number of patients uh, in each of these categories based on the different um, classifications that were used. Interesting as well, in this particular cohort, again, relatively young age, uh, under the age of 18 uh, as, your, uh, as your mean, uh, median actually, um, cirrhosis was seen in only 5%, so relatively small number. A sister uh, paper that came out shortly after that uh, was looking at um, our level of hepatic fibrosis using the serious red staining uh, in 74 patients and looking more at the clinical aspects uh, of these individuals. And so, let's see if that comes out. Uh, this particular group, 74 patients, biopsy age was a little bit younger, time from Fontan, almost 15 years. And you see some of the clinical characteristics. Uh, interestingly, most of the patients in this group, because of their age, were uh, a relic of when we were doing mostly lateral tunnel Fontan. So 60% had lateral tunnel, 36% had extracardiac conduit, fenestrations were patent in about 40%, um, as is our population in Philadelphia. Uh, more than half were HLHS, so 55% single ventricle of right ventricular morphology. And uh, as you head down the list here, a fair number, 19% uh, had PLE, 9% had plastic bronchitis. So not all of them were, were perfect from the lymphatic perspective. And they all underwent cath and liver biopsy. Here's the distribution of the percent collagen deposition amongst that group. And what you see starting from this point going forward is uh, divisions by 10 percentage points, 0 to 10%, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, or greater than 40%. You can see that 73% were uh, at, uh, at least uh, 10 to 20%. So gives us a general sense of uh, what the spectrum of the degree of fibrosis would be that we would see in this particular population. And then in this table uh, is the, the point of the paper, which is a search to see what clinical characteristics might be associated uh, with the magnitude of liver fibrosis. Looking at BNP, prothrombin time, you know, a variety of, of labs that could reflect um, liver fibrosis, your inferior vena cable pressure, end diastolic pressure, cardiac index, collateral burden as a percent of total aortic flow. None of these clinical variables were associated with the magnitude of fibrosis. The one that was significant was age. And that's demonstrated in this graph here. We see time from Fontan, 
on the bottom and the percent serious red staining uh, in the uh, y-axis. And again, a bit of a scattergram. Um, so clearly, there is some degree of variability, but it was the only parameter that was of significance amongst all of our clinical parameters in looking at what might influence the magnitude of serious red staining, suggesting, unfortunately, that there's a relentless impact of the Fontan over time that leads to continued liver fibrosis. So the next thing we did, uh, it's about a year or two uh, later, was to look at a subset of patients who had uh, good quality MR scans contemporaneously around the time of the liver biopsies to see if we could look at some fluid dynamics of the Fontan pathway as to whether that might influence the magnitude of fibrosis. This is work that we did in conjunction with Georgia Tech. Um, they've been doing some fantastic work, some of you may know, um, Ajit Yoganathan and his work and Mark Fogel. Um, and we sort of brought together our, our liver work with, uh, with some of Mark's uh, efforts and uh, Ajit's efforts uh, in looking at computational flow dynamics. We were quite confident we were going to find something here that would be associated with the magnitude of liver fibrosis. Uh -uh. Nothing. Um, no matter what flow characteristic you looked at, so long as you had a Fontan, you still had fibrosis, and the type of flow through the Fontan didn't seem to make a difference. But something interesting that we did identify was that the greater the degree of collagen deposition, the greater the magnitude of liver fibrosis, the higher the IVC flow was. Which at first is kind of like, well, that doesn't make much sense, but it does if you understand what I said earlier about why focal nodular hyperplasia develops, which is arterialization to the liver. Arterialization to the liver leads to increased blood flow to the liver. That blood has to exit in some way. It exits through the IVC. So IVC flow, flow, not pressure, is a reflection of arterialization, which occurs uh, in association with the magnitude of liver fibrosis. So we found this to be a sort of an interesting finding. And therefore, to some degree, came to a conclusion also that perhaps having liver fibrosis is a volume load on the ventricle through the process of arterialization, which is kind of a, an interesting, novel, surprising finding uh, here, that not only is the liver fibrosis itself a problem for the liver, but liver fibrosis leads to arterialization, which then increases your uh, flow, uh, your QP, essentially, of the blood that's making its way into the Fontan pathway. So uh, Mark then had another question uh, that was interesting. He was, he was wanted to ask whether or not, knowing that we, again, do serial MRs on most of our patients, uh, was there anything at a cardiac MR previous to the one done in association with liver biopsy that could predict a future development of a particular magnitude of liver fibrosis? So it was a further subset of the, the 70 patients. It was 20, 21 patients where we looked at uh, their CMR uh, about five years prior uh, to the liver biopsy itself and tried to see if there were any features there that were associated with the present collagen deposition. And in that study, what was found was that um, the presence of LPA stenosis early on could predict the later development of uh, the magnitude, was associated with the magnitude of liver fibrosis at a later point in time, as well as your overall Fontana resistance, which kind of makes sense. And then the idea here was that inefficient TCPC designed uh, design or vessel stenosis would lead to some degree of increased hepatic congestion, progression of liver fibrosis, hepatic arterialization, and therefore an increase in IVC flow rate. So some interesting insights from, from some of this work. OK. You still with me on this? Good. This is a cardiologist talking about the liver. So again, I, 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 apologies here. But this, I, I think there are some insights here from this sort of hybrid, hybrid approach of looking at both the liver and the, 
in hemodynamics. Okay, now we're going to get into some areas that I'm on, I might be on some shaky ground, but uh, the how and the why. Um, what I'm showing you here is a page from um, the website for Additional Ventures. So I don't know if any of you have heard of this particular group or organization, uh, but they are making a big difference in the single ventricle research world. Um, this is common information, so I'm not sharing any HIPAA uh, data here, but um, this is derived from a, a grateful family, the Hoffman family um, in um, Palo Alto, uh, who, um, if you are at all, you know, uh, interested in sort of tech and tech history and those sorts of things in IT, uh, the Hoffmans of Reed Hoffman, who founded uh, LinkedIn, and Reed Hoffman is, you know, uh, involved with many of the AI efforts currently underway as well. So it's a relative of his, and they have a child with single ventricle infantam, cared for at Stanford. Um, the family um, gratefully has started a foundation um, that uh, has, and this is again public knowledge, probably close to about $400 million uh, in the foundation. And uh, their goals are as follows. Uh, I kind of found it humorous to list this here. It's biomedical research focused on single ventricle, but also climate action and community and democracy. <laughs> now, which of these three things are going to be most difficult to deal with and manage? <laughs> community and democracy in the world? Climate? <laughs> or single ventricle? They seem to be equivalent here. So I found that, that somewhat humorous. But here's how they're going about uh, trying to make a difference for single ventricle, and that is funding research efforts uh, at a variety of different institutions. There's now an American Heart Association Additional Ventures um, grant uh, application that's open uh, currently, and a number of centers are applying for this. So there's, they're, they're, they're influencing the current organizations, and they're changing the landscape, I think, of um, trying to draw uh, people into this realm of research that may not ordinarily be involved in Fontana research or single ventricle or congenital heart disease research. Uh, now, why am I saying this? Because um, uh, I uh, have to say that we've been recipients of funding from this organization. And I'm going to show you some data, or at least some efforts that are underway in collecting data that relates to some, some interesting questions. And it relates to fibrosis. So offering a little bit of a different perspective. We've just been talking about liver fibrosis and what it looks like and how we try to grade it with autopsy, uh, not autopsy, with biopsy, sometimes an autopsy, but mostly with biopsy. But I will remind you of something you already know, which is that uh, the liver is not the only organ that is fibrosed uh, in our patients with single ventricle myocardial fibrosis is something that we know exists as well. Um, it can lead to arrhythmia, diastolic dysfunction, progressive systolic dysfunction, uh, it's not necessarily related to the scars that are uh, imposed by the time if you do an RV to PA conduit. Sure, that gives you a scar. But myocardial um, scarring is present in our single ventricle patients to variable degrees. I mentioned it this morning. Uh, we know that the kidney typically is not affected early on, but is there fibrosis in the kidney? And the answer is yes. We have not been looking or focusing our attention on that because the kidney in this situation is extremely resilient. But if you start to look at elastography measures or other assessments of liver fibrosis on autopsy, we don't have biopsy data on this in Fontaine yet, but there is kidney fibrosis that's there as well. So therefore, perhaps one could ask the question, you know, is there a link between these? And on more of a regulatory biological basis, does the Fontan circulation promote fibrogenesis? We know that fibrosis is a biologically important process for wound healing, but could dysregulated fibrogenesis be scarring the organs and impairing organ function when you have a Fontan circulation? So it's approaching it not just from the isolated liver perspective, but looking more from the biological perspective. And why might this be the case? Uh, let me propose to you that there's a host of things that are happening to our patients early on that could all 
lead potentially to an increased risk for fibrosis diffusely uh, in these individuals. We have cyanosis, we have some degree of inflammation early on, hemodynamic derangements, venous and lymphatic congestion. There is vascular trauma that's taking place, uh, both uh, at a microscopic and perhaps a, mic a macroscopic uh, level. And so I'm going to propose to you the following. I don't yet have the data to fully convince myself or you that this is the case, but this, we know, can happen. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is upregulated when you have cyanosis, inflammation, or hemodynamic derangements, as we see. There may be other mechanisms, such as mechanotransduction, when you have elevated central venous pressure. Vascular trauma influences platelet function or platelet dysfunction. Platelets are rich in serotonin. And we know that an upregulation of the renin angiotensin system and serotonin can lead to an upregulation of TGF beta 1. And TGF beta 1 is the common pathway for fibroblasts to lay down collagen potentially in all the organs that we're seeing. So, what we're seeing in the liver may be the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, one manifestation of what may be a more diffuse risk for biological fibrogenesis. So this is a hypothesis that we're posing. And how do we try and answer that? Uh, it's by uh, looking at genetic associations, potentially, that may be regulating, and for us to begin to look at the magnitude of fibrosis in these different organs. And to date, nobody's yet looked at that. Certainly, the kidney's been fully ignored. But what we proposed um, as part of our additional ventures project, which has now been completed, the data is being analyzed, was to use a variety of techniques, including uh, MR elastography, primarily done all through MR, looking at um, MR stiffness values in the liver. So this is how somebody had asked earlier about how that's done with, with MR. Um, there are well-established MR techniques that allow one to do this. Um, there's a, um, a variety of different ways to induce a signal through the liver, then you interpret how the liver responds to the signal that's going through it uh, with the, these uh, color uh, codes defining a stiffer material, material versus less stiff material. And you can do that for the liver. Um, you can also uh, use sophisticated MR algorithms that can uh, give you a sense of overall burden of fibrosis something called T1 row mapping. Uh, that's, excuse me, still relatively new technology, but uh, you send a pulse signal through tissue, and then you look for the decay of time of that signal, which appears to be associated with the magnitude of total organ fibrosis. So we're doing this in livers, kidneys, and in the heart, uh, and seeing if there might be an association uh, and some of the preliminary data is, is quite interesting. Again, I don't have it analyzed yet. I uh, can't show it to you here to have any reasonable discussion, but, but this is work that's underway. The second project that is now um, also uh, currently underway, but halfway done, and, and I, I think has really uh, been quite fascinating, is to dive even more deeply into what may be the biology of having a Fontan circulation from a dysregulatory perspective. So this is where we really get to be far afield of my expertise as a primarily a clinician, but uh, single cell and single nuclear RNA sequencing is a current technology uh, by analyzing cells from a particular uh, organ system uh, and looking at the RNA or DNA map of that cell from a genetic perspective gives you a sense of what that cell's been up to <laughs> and how it's been either performing normally or not performing normally based on the upregulation or downregulation of particular genes. So I, I've gotten one uh, colleague, a scientist over at Penn, interested in this, and this is like his career now. It's Liming Pei, uh, and he's dedicated his uh, RNA sequencing lab to looking at our biopsy specimens to try and help decipher uh, what's going on. And these look like really impressive, fancy graphs. So that's why I'm showing them to you. 
but I have very little clue about what they mean except to, to, to say that when Liming shows these to me. Well, first let me tell you what, what the study was. We, we took um, control uh, liver samples, patients who uh, either died from motor vehicle accidents or such, or supposedly had healthy livers, and uh, the livers were stored in our pathology lab, and then we compared them to four Fontan patients. That's all you really needed to do for these, these types of studies because every patient's you know, sample's got thousands of cells. So you got plenty of, set. each cell is its own subject, if you will, in the study. So you don't need lots of patients to do single cell uh, sequencing, nuclear sequencing. Um, but what was, he was able to show, what he tells me these graphs show, is that unlike the control livers, the Fontan livers appear to have upregulation of a variety of genes within the central hepatocytes as well as upregulation, not surprisingly, of the hepatic cellate cells, uh, which are being transformed into your fibroblasts. That, that makes sense. But unlike other fibrotic conditions, where typically your central hepatocytes are fine, it's the central hepatocytes here that are on fire and, and altering their genetic makeup and making all sorts of molecules that are then signaling the hepatic stellate cells to turn into fibroblasts that then lay down collagen and cause the fibrosis. So these are just some more fancy looking slides. Uh, I'm gonna skip over these pretty quickly, but to get to the following, that not only can you look at, uh, with this technology, look at the variability of, of the genes, the, the how variable the genetic burden uh, and uh, differences from normal, but you can identify what these genes are doing. So which are the genes, what are the class of genes that are most on fire and, uh, and, uh, and active? And that gives you a sense of what this is doing from a biological perspective. So Fontan liver cells appear to be affecting, Fontan livers appear to be affecting most of the central hepatocytes but also endothelial cells and hepatic cellate cells. And genes in particular, areas of regulation, peroxisome metabolism and others appear to be the ones that are most upregulated. So how do we begin to put all this together into a, uh, an understanding of, of uh, the mechanism here? I've got two um, uh, slides here that uh, I'm gonna show you that I think enhance each other. Uh, and this is uh, um, uh, a slide more of the clinical variables that are playing a role here. So you start out with an infant with single ventricle, you end up with a Glenn and a Fontan operation. And here are the things that happen to you. You exist in a hypoxic state. There might be, even before presentation, heart failure or cardiovascular collapse, potential injury to the liver at that point. There's the potential for perioperative insult based on the operations that you get done to treat your, your Fontan. So all of these lead to some degree of insult. The insult itself can be augmented based on sustained cardiovascular stress, and then a layer on top of that, traditional risk factors, which play a role in our adolescent and our adult. And then there are further biological changes that are taking place over time, arterialization of flow, perhaps changes in the matrix um, of the makeup of the liver, and uh, mediation and upregulation of TGF beta that all lead to a state of dysregulation, fibrosis, and cirrhosis. What Liming <clears throat> has shown, and this is a paper now uh, in press uh, in uh, science translation that will be out uh, shortly. So, uh, uh, in other words, some real scientists out there thought there was value in this, even though it's some, this remote, you know, field of such. But uh, we're pleased that this is, uh, you know, beginning to, to uh, engender some interest in, in the real scientific community. So what this shows is a little bit more of the, the biology. Again, so here's your central vein with increased pressure, hepatic artery and portal vein. Here are your central hepatocytes. And what's happening at the central hepatocyte 
is upregulation of small molecule metabolism, xenobiotic responses, and an increase in cellular oxidative reductive activity that appears to be increasing levels of development of uh, agents known as active in A and active in B that are being emitted by the central hepatocyte and are now are uh, putative signaling agents unique to the Fontan circulation to the HSC, the hepatic cellate cell, that is then turning into fibroblasts and creating the, uh, the, the liver fibrosis. Now, why is all this so important? Because, believe it or not, there are uh, agents out there that block active in A and B. So uh, the excitement here is that as we improve our understanding of the biology of this, um, of how unique and specific to Fontan patients, there's a transition from the increased pressure in the central hepatocyte to the stress the hepatocyte is seeing and what it's doing biologically, we might be able to block it in some way. Uh, and ultimately, the goal would be to develop a, a drug that could potentially inhibit this particular transition unique to, to this condition. All right. That, and it gets to what I just said, which is, okay, how do we take any of this and begin to manage and, and treat these patients? Uh, at this point in time, the elephant in the room. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done. And even though there is, you know, a sense of confusion out there uh, and such, there, there are some starting points. Uh, the AHA statement uh, is one. Um, and it's, um, again, as I've said, and I always continue to say, it's, there's no evidence base for any of these particular recommendations here, except for consensus, professional consensus, and common sense. And when you look at the liver, there are a variety of different ways in which one can assess these patients, either from a basic or an in-depth perspective. And I think most centers around the country now that are you know, following Fontan patients are doing something in some way for this. And consensus is necessary, there's no question, in terms of being able to systematically approach this and begin to learn you know, from it. But, but there are things that can be done. Um, We've come a long way, I think, from this initial description by Gaffari and Hutchins, again, back in 2005, to where we are today. But this is what we want to prevent, the transition of these patients from a fibrotic state to one with hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is a uh, study Yuli Kim has uh, put together, is now in press in the European Heart Journal, where um, I think maybe even your center may have participated in this. Uh, it was a, a, a national uh, survey of patients with HCC to look at their outcomes. And, you know, I was under the impression that you have HCC, you're done, you know, with this condition. But the, but the answer actually is that that's not the case, that there are a number of patients with HCC, if caught early, where this can be remedied. Uh, the five-year survival is about 50%. But it depends on how you look at this glass, half empty or half full. It does mean that some patients, perhaps, who are caught early can survive. And that's where this makes a difference. So uh, my last slide, uh, what do we think we know and where are the gaps in knowledge? Because I was actually asked to put this together by the AV group um, in a presentation to the AHA a couple of weeks ago to kind of distill, I think, where, where the field is. What do we think we know? Liver fibrosis is universal at all patients with a Fontan circulation and appears to progress with age. Both portal and central fibrosis are present. Fald is related probably primarily to a congestive hepatopathy of elevated central venous pressure, but it's not the only explanation. There are other factors that have to be contributive, and we don't understand exactly what the formula, what the recipe is that gets us to a particular form of, of fibrosis, and we still need to figure that out. Liver fibrosis can lead to cirrhosis. The two should be distinguished. Not every patient with a Fontan has cirrhosis. And what's the prevalence? Under age 18, about 5%. And it's about 10 to 15% in our adults. And probably progressive as uh, they, they progress in their age. Liver biopsy imaging indicates a patchy nature to the disease. And 
it all leads to a risk for hepatocellular carcinoma, prevalence being about 2 to 3% in patients over the age of 18. So this is all evidence-based. Okay, where are the gaps in knowledge? I could give you 10 more slides of that, but it'll, it'll all fit on this slide. The optimal and accurate clinical characterization of the disease remains a challenge. What labs should we be performing? What imaging? Um, the elastography dilemma exists, meaning we measure stiffness, but stiffness is contributed to by both congestion and fibrosis. So how do you tease the two out? If you have an elevated elastography value, this remains a challenge. A reliable protocol that's universally accepted for clinical surveillance still remains elusive. It's unclear the specific risk factors that are associated with the severity of liver disease, and that severity is quite wide in magnitude. There's a poor understanding of the mechanical biological process and the impact of a Fontan's circulation on the notion of diffuse fibrogenesis involving the liver and the kidney as well. There's a poor understanding of the cellular and regulatory aspects of the disease, although work that uh, Liming Pei and others are doing might help give us some clues to the biology. And absent the complete understanding of the mechanistic origins, effective treatments remain elusive, such as potentially might there be reversibility with alterations in hemodynamics? Might we be able to identify agents that could block the disease progression? And is the disease preventable or reversible? Uh, are still open questions. So with that, I'll end uh, and look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reichek. That was fantastic, uh, very thought-provoking. And I thought um, we would do kind of part two of this talk as kind of a fireside chat. If people have questions, I'm sure we've got lots of questions and comments. And we're going to bring Dr. Lin down also so he can help us more with liver. Um, and so do we have another microphone by chance? Or we do not. So. Is there, hmm, I'm trying to figure out the best way to do this since he doesn't have a mic. Thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, I was just wondering, you had made mention of that one two-year-old who already had evidence of fibrosis. And I was curious about um, how many patients prior to the Fontan you've done liver biopsies on and whether you think there's fluid dynamics even in utero that potentially contribute to um, the start of this at least? Yeah, there's very little data on that, very few. So we've not routinely done liver biopsies uh, pre-Fontan. Uh, the information we have uh, is from a paper, Henry, I think you may have been involved with also, uh, or maybe not, but it was a, a series of um, just a survey of uh, liver uh, autopsies in our patients who die for other reasons, you know, post stage one or, or Glenn. And uh, there were variable degrees of liver fibrosis present uh, in those patients. Now, of course, in an necropsy study like that, you know, could the disease that led to the untimely demise have contributed in some way to injury to the liver as well? Um, perhaps. But uh, I think, and I didn't list it, but I think that's an unanswered question, which is what, to what degree are there liver differences that each one of these patients bring to the table at the time of the Fontan itself? I suspect that there is, but uh, I can't say for sure what, what it is or what the magnitude is. I mean, I'll add to that just tangentially, uh, you know, there have been some of the studies that have looked at uh, elastography. I know you mentioned some of the limitations with elastography of, you know, if it's elevated, is it from fibrosis? Is it from congestive hepatopathy? Uh, but there have been some that have looked at elastography right at the time of Fontan and have tracked it, you know, a few, like, post-Fontan day one to, you know, 30 days post-Fontan, and then they show almost immediately you have that increase, you know, in, in pressures. Uh, and so, you know, again, it'd be nice if you had that pre aspect of it, but you know, certainly we know that that dynamic changes pretty quickly. Hey, uh, really great talk. Um, you make a compelling case that the TGF beta pathway is intrinsic to um, you know, collagen synthesis and fibrotic progression. Any work being done to look at TGF beta 
inhibitors specifically. I know that would be really expensive to do prospectively over the time frame, but retrospectively, something like Losartan is used frequently enough with a big enough data set, it may be possible to see some signal. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question, and I think what you're also getting at is something that I would love to be able to do, which is something that could explain the variability that we see um, in our patients. Um, so, it, you know, cohort, 17 patients, all managed at our center, 17-year-old uh, patients all managed at our center. Uh, we've now looked at close to 300. It's not the surgeon, it's not the anatomy, it's not any of the variables we've looked at, but we have not looked at whether they've been on ACE inhibitors or, or other agents. So there could be other factors that might influence this in some way, and I think a, a deeper dive in looking at the clinical characterization of these perhaps more broadly in a multi-center manner might give us some clues uh, to that. But I think that's a, that's a great point, which is, you know, I, I joked about it earlier that, uh, you know, we, we uh, continue to see patients with single ventricle who are on 2.5 milligrams of enalapril. They've been on that, you know, since their Fontan and their cardiologist is afraid to stop it because it's, can, you know, s supported their wellness or contributed to their, quote, state of wellness at the time. But to really look at patients who've been on ACE inhibitors or other agents, um, you know, is something I think it's worthwhile doing. Conversely as well, one of the things that we're doing uh, now also, we started to do this a couple of years back, was if we do a biopsy, we find um, a significant, more than the average amount of fibrosis that's present, um, we will start those patients on aldosterone inhibition with spironolactone being known uh, clearly to be an antifibrotic, an anti-inflammatory, to decongestant, it's a mild diuretic, great for diastolic function, lucitropic agent. I mean, it's, it's your perfect Fontan liver agent with an incredibly safe uh, profile. Um, so we now have a significant cohort of patients who have been on uh, aldosterone inhibition for a while. We haven't looked at that data yet, but it's probably something we should do. Really intrigued by the um, Kathy Holmes, and I'm interested in Marfan syndrome. But so I'm the whole TGF beta pathway is sort of interesting on a different level. Um, the Atenolol and Losartan study did show a, and there was a subset of group that had a difference in effect based on some of their liver enzymatic um, processing. So something just to sort of think about as this pathway goes forward, just in terms of whether a particular group might process a particular drug better or worse, or how that would work. And, and I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on the inflammatory processes that you're, you're um, thinking about. And then the last question that um, I'm thinking about is, OK, so I understand the, the hypothesis with the liver, but how does that then relate to the kidney if fibrosis is happening everywhere? Is that just generalized um, inflammatory cells that are, that are going awry? Or is it because it can't be the same diastolic you know, increase well, uh, to address the last point, it, it, the um, kidney is uh, in the same system as is the liver. The only difference is proximity <laughs> to, the, to the Fontan pathway. So whatever elevated central venous pressure exists in the liver, that same elevated central venous pressure sits in the kidney. So it's actually surprising that we haven't recognized that the kidney is at risk as well. It's just a much more resilient organ, most likely. Um, and we just haven't looked because we haven't seen clinical manifestations in the young. We do see it in the older patients. I mean, many of the uh, adults do have some degree of renal dysfunction, and your GFR progressively drops. There's data to show that in, in those with Fontan. So I just think we haven't looked. But, uh, but I think it is the same process that's underway. And um, um, no reason to think that it isn't the same process, but we'll, we'll try and answer that as best as we can. In relation to the inflammation, so I, I don't think I inflammation is an ongoing active major process in a Fontan patient. The inflammation is the episodic inflammation that occurs as a consequence of being hypoxic uh, and having the injury of presentation uh, in a, in a uh, you know, secondary to hemodynamic changes. and having to undergo hypothermic circulatory arrest and bypass multiple times before you even get to a Fontan. So those are episodic events of inflammation that could in some way contribute to creating a vulnerable liver. 
Um, I have a question for both of you, really. Um, I think it's fair to say that as a center, we're, we're still finding our groove in terms of you know, how often and when we want to biopsy. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Henry, but that's sort of my, my impression. Um, I think it would help um, if we had a sort of algorithmic uh, approach to what we would do with the results. Um, you know, you mentioned that you know, if you see severe, see severe um, fibrosis, uh, you would start them on you know, medication potentially for that. Um, what would, you, what would you, your response be, you know, how we should um, have those results influence our actions if we had serial results um, currently? Well, so yeah, um, I, I can uh, share how it's influenced our approach. So it, it is not done in isolation. It's a liver biopsy in conjunction with cardiac cath and a cardiac MR. So we are getting um, hemodynamic and cardiovascular characterization at the same time as we're understanding what's going on in the liver. And so let's pick a variety of different scenarios. If we have, uh, and, and these are being done again in individuals who are entering their adolescent and young adult years. If we have a minimal amount of fibrosis and the hemodynamics are great, check. You get an A grade or an A minus or whatever. High grade, you're good. If on the other hand, we find abnormalities at the time of the cath, uh, which occurs about 15% of our patients, so we publish that, and these are, you know, um, findings that were not necessarily evident on echo or other routine screening. Then you've improved the status of the patient, again, as they enter adolescence. So you've done something at that point, okay. But your question more is, okay, it's just specific and focused on the liver. If the liver is abnormal, what are the hemodynamics doing? Is your PA pressure over 15? Is your PVR elevated? In the face of um, a higher burden of liver fibrosis and elevated PA pressures, we will consider PD-5 inhibition in that individual. And maybe as well flag them for an increased rate of surveillance of their liver as they again get into their adolescent uh, and adult years. The bigger challenge is what to do if you have superb hemodynamics and you have a lot of fibrosis. But still, it's important, we think, to know that because we would still maintain a higher level of surveillance of their liver, and we would try and do things like aldosterone inhibition, even though there's nothing about the hemodynamics that necessarily would indicate that. So again, this is absent data that's shown that, that this is effective, but it does, we think, in a low-risk manner, create a um, level of characterization that's important as these individuals enter into their adult years and knowing where they are in that spectrum with any one of those particular combinations gives us this, uh, a way of either patting the patient on the back and saying, you're great, keep going, or there's some element of concern here, let us increase our surveillance, maybe repeat the biopsy in five years, maybe uh, offer more frequent elastography values, because we're doing the elastography at the same time we do our biopsy, so we know what that value is and see if we can maneuver things to try and reduce the elastography, the stiffness levels. I mean, I think to add to that, yeah, maybe the first part of your question, you know, Lars, is, you know, what are potential indications for biopsy and maybe even beyond surveillance, you know? And so from a liver standpoint, one of the biggest challenges I find is, well, what level of elevated liver enzymes can we associate with Fontan associated liver disease versus do I need to be looking in an adolescent to say, well, should I be worried about an autoimmune hepatitis or other etiologies? And so we know from experience, you know, from the CHOP cohort that we expect your AST ALT to be a little bit more elevated. We expect mild elevations of your GGT beyond baseline. But when it, you know, but I think the challenge is as a hepatologist, if you didn't have Fontan liver disease, then I'd say I'd go straight to a biopsy, or I'd do some additional uh, diagnostic workup. And the corollary I think about this is it's very similar to our fatty liver patients. You know, you have a phenotype that says there's a clear reason of why you have elevated liver enzymes. How long do you observe before you say, do I need to be looking for other etiologies? And so 
Uh, sometimes what we fall into, and I think that speaks to the benefit of routine surveillance of the liver labs to say, you know, if, if those labs are going up, you know, on an annual basis, maybe do we need to be thoughtful of these other conditions? Um, and, and also, uh, you know, something that you mentioned in, in the talk, Dr. Rychuk, was, you know, trying to d uh, differentiate between nodularity and the risk of HCC. Uh, certainly, we check an alpha fetal protein level, which is a marker of hepatis, you know, like liver cell turnover. And if that's elevated, it increases our suspicion uh, of a uh, of a liver uh, malignancy. Uh, but, you know, oftentimes we're getting ultrasounds or MRs that say the liver's nodular. And we know that the data says that, you know, 20 to 30 percent of uh, individuals with Fontan uh, physiology have some sort of nodularity. But then, you know, do we go straight to an MRI and then look to see is there that difference in the T1, T2 images uh, to say is this nodule uh, concerning? Uh, do we biopsy at that point? Um, you know, and, and I, so I think there's just a lot of nuances to it in which it really speaks to the need for routine liver surveillance, you know, but when it comes to biopsy, uh, I remember thinking, you know, the program at CHOP is, un and I don't want to say unique, but if I remember correctly, we're biopsying at 10 years post-Fontan, roughly, to kind of establish that baseline, and I think that's where maybe Lars, you're getting at is, you know, is there, you know, what's unique about 10 years, or is it just because we're getting into that adolescent period, is my suspicion. Yeah, well, the thing about uh, the 10-year and the adolescent thing is uh, it derives from the PHN work looking at the decline in exercise capacity that seems to happen uh, around adolescent time in, in all Fontans. Whereas those of us who are not Fontans, when you get to adolescence, it's a time for an increase in your max VO2. Naturally, that's what happens. We build you know, muscle mass and all that. And in the Fontans, it's exactly the opposite. They start to drop off. Um, and so um, that's, and, and again, you look at some of the clinical studies, as I showed, age 16 appears to be, you know, where you are at that point, which is kind of mid-adolescent, is predictive of where you're going to be years down the road. So therefore, that 10-year mark comes out to be about, you know, for us, age 14 or so, knowing where you are, this is how we explain it to families when we're, you know, consenting and that sort of thing for something that's not routine elsewhere, um, will say, look, we, we want to best understand how your child is doing as they're entering this important period of their life for our ability to prognosticate, as well as possibly for us to find things that may require some touching up here and there, an LPA that's narrow, you know, too much collateral flow, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But also, if we know where your liver is, we can associate the liver biopsy magnitude of fibrosis with, um, with non-invasive measures that we then can say, okay, this equals this. Now we can follow this in you and see how you're doing. Thank you for a nice talk again. And many questions are really um, resolved in today's sessions. And Mike, so especially I was really excited to hear that RNA seek. And you found that activin is uh, looks like very important role to cause liver fibrosis. And so when I think of pulmonary um, hypertension, so t um, like BMP and TGF signaling is Mm, well known, to, so the, these pathways um, have an uh, important role to cause pulmonary fibrosis. So I'm wondering this pulmonary hypertension and liver fibrosis mechanism looks like shared. And so that's why I'm really excited. And my question is, so the, that RNA-seq, so what kind of patient, so I want to know the profile of that patient, so the sample, ah, so that's like yeah. the end of the end stage or like um, pre- like, No, they were all patients with, uh, there were four patients that were included in the RNA sequencing study uh, that came through the program, routine surveillance, uh, mean age of about 16 or so, um, and they all had uh, serious red staining that was between 20 and 30 percent. So, and with no cirrhosis, so these were our sort of ideal, typical um, Fontan with moderate fibrosis. Mm -hmm. 
I see. So second question is maybe question is for hepatology question. So that t t is TGF or BMP signaling considered as oncogene in in liver? So it is my second question. Yes, I'm sorry. Say again. The so uh, you focus on activin. So activin. Activin. Is, yeah, yeah, activin. Activin is BM, TGF and BMP signaling. So and my I want to confirm that so TGF or BMP signaling is considered as oncogene in the liver or not because some of the Fontan patients got HCC in the future. An so oncogene. That's why, I yeah. see. Yes. Yes. Uh, I do not know the answer to that. That's a, that's a good question. You know, is Activin uh, involved in that in some way? That's a great question. I would have to go back to uh, to our uh, experts on this and, and sort of ask them. But I think we're looking primarily for the, you know, what what are the uh, true steps, the mechanisms, the biological mechanisms that are happening, knowing that the central hepatocytes are the ones that are revved up. They're doing something, they're signaling something to the uh, stellate cells that are transforming them into fibroblasts. So um, it seems like we may have some signals that are suggesting that it's the active in, you know, pathway. Um, I guess the next thing to do would be to develop some sort of a model in some way where we can recapitulate that and then offer active in inhibitors to see if that might make a difference. And then, sure, sir, yeah, so this is a, a uh, one could, I guess, say a relatively early phase, right? Um, it's not the earliest, but it's relatively early, and certainly uh, it's different than what we're seeing in the older patients, but, you know, it, it all starts from the same substrate of sort of a general background level of fibrosis and progressive fibrosis that then leads to cirrhosis in HCC. Uh, thank you for the great talk and for your uh, prolonged Q&A session. The, um, I have two questions for you. One is about FGF beta 1 expression in the kidney. Is it overexpressed in the kidney? Or is that known? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> Not ashamed to say. Don't know that. Um, but... Um, uh, so, uh, I think everybody here has a general sense that, you know, obtaining tissue from these patients is not a routine. And even doing the liver biopsies are controversial. And I'll tell you, even within our own center, we've actually started to back away from that and being becoming more selective. Um, so we have 300 patients where we routinely did it, and just in the last year or so, we've been backing away because, again, the same questions come up, okay, what are you really, why are you doing this? And what are you really gaining from it? Even though I have to say, we've had no complications. Um, you know, and these are percutaneous biopsies that are being done. Um, so we've had really had no complications. We don't have enough kidney tissue uh, to sample, and certainly we're not. I can't rationalize, at least at this point, doing you know renal biopsies on our Fontan patients. So we have to kind of go probably to the to the pathology and the necropsy. Uh, uh, you know, realm to begin to, to get this tissue and, and to look at it. Or uh, we need to focus more attention on uh, some of the techniques that we're offering, which is the elastography measure. So instead of looking at the biology of, of the kidney itself, just trying to first document whether in fact there is um, increased stiffness. And the answer is yes. Even though we haven't published that data, I can tell you that the MR uh, elastography measures in the kidneys are abnormal. Uh, and seem to be associated with the magnitude of stiffness that we're seeing in the liver as well. So that's consistent with the notion, again, that it's, you know, we're all connected to the same system, the same circular, you know, vascular system. What stiffness you're seeing in the liver is being transmitted into the kidney as well. Okay, second question. Um, maybe more challenging, I guess, but um, another organ of interest is the pancreas mm. that is kind of uh, mm -hmm. forgotten, I guess, and... Um, so hyperglycemia, diabetes is very common, and so your, your presentation raised the question of whether fibrosis of the pancreas is actually contributing to... Um, I think it's a great question as well. Or, I mean, we, we do not 
appear to see too much pancreatic dysfunction clinically. In other words, I will tell you that uh, pancreatitis uh, uh, and certainly uh, chemical evidence to pancreatitis is, has been reported and is not, I would say, extremely rare in, in Fontan patients. But diabetes, per se, um, independent of the sort of the other metabolic things that you would expect, you know, does not appear to be terribly different in this population. So if there is pancreatic uh, fibrosis, uh, we're, and I don't know if there is, we're not seeing clinical manifestations of it. So, given the patchy nature of disease of the liver, the way we do biopsies here is during a cath, we put in a, a long sheath and then place a needle through the IVC into the liver and collect tissue. Um, unless you're doing it differently, my concern has always been that we're miss, we could be missing something based on the random nature of where we select the tissue and introducing heterogeneity into the, into the data. So we, we might not see something, but it's actually there. I've always felt more confident if we had some way of, of imaging the liver and then selectively taking tissue from areas that we're concerned about and putting that into the database. Yeah, so we don't do it that way. Uh, we uh, we uh, decided to do it, and it may have been with your input back back then that uh, we felt that uh, if we were to do it um, internally, that we would be self-selecting tissue that would be most affected. Um, and so we do percutaneous, uh, meaning uh, patients in a cath lab, uh, they're reversed, um, and um, our IR folks come in and do two stabs with a 16 millimeter uh, gauge, 16 gauge needle uh, into the liver. Ultrasound guided, so they're using, you know, some ultrasound um, evidence of where to go, you know, plus minus as to how, how helpful that is, but that's been fairly routine. Uh, two, again, two passes, and um, it takes like three minutes to do, and, uh, and they're done. Now, one of the reasons we are shying away from this is because actually our cath docs are saying, We've had it with waiting for the IR docs to come down, uh, and we got to get the next patient in, you know, and we're waiting. So I have to get in our IR docs to come down a little bit more uh, efficiently. But, um, you know, joking aside, it, it, it's um, the, the cath lab, and it's been Jack Rome primarily who has supported and actually sort of initiated this, this notion that we need to be looking at the liver more carefully. And um, so we do it percutaneously. have the IR guys come down, and that's how they do it, uh, through the IVC randomly into the liver. And that's, you know, we're willing to put the time in and, and delay our cases for that, but our level of confidence that we're giving uh, our clinicians important data, accurate data, um, is, is really not very strong. Yeah. So uh, what do you, th in terms of the Field are most people doing it your way, or are most people doing it the way we're doing it here? Uh, Do you know, most centers are not doing biopsies for for this exact reason um, that uh, there is just tremendous heterogeneity, and it's unclear if you're getting select you know tissue and such. So uh, we are probably the one center that's doing the most biopsies, and we, we've been doing them percutaneously. Thanks, Jack. This has been a really nice day. Um, my question pertains to just surveillance and um, liver uh, elastography and MRI. Um, do you think you're moving more towards MRI imaging in coordination with your elastography to get a better idea of perhaps those who have the nodularity influences the elastography? And I can't think of a Fontan where I looked at the liver on MRI. We do do look at the heart for fibrosis, but. Yeah, um, so I mean, MR of, of the liver, yeah. yeah. Correct. Uh, Thank you. 
If I had my druthers, I would love to do MRs on all of our livers. Um, technically and logistically, it, that's difficult to do and to do serially. So we have um, shifted more towards the use of ultrasound because obviously it's easier to schedule bedside and because we've, you know, it was a matter of uh, doing what I think is a better study, an MR, in less patients who are older versus bringing this to our younger population with ultrasound. Um, and so that's what we've done of late. Uh, so the vast majority of our elastography samples um, are in the six, eight, 10 year old who's coming through. They get an ultrasound, it's quick. We get that information and we move them along. Our um, radiologists have gotten better at doing this as well because uh, early on it was, the numbers were all over the place and they were using different machines and that sort of thing. So now we've standardized it. There's a core group of folks that do the ultrasound. Um, they pick up on, on interesting nodules as well occasionally, so we'll get that report. But um, once a nodule is identified, then we do an MR with gadolinium, with EAVIST, to help distinguish the focal nodule hyperplasia from uh, potential HCC. Yeah, I, w I would say that's our, been our general practice as well. I mean, I think here we're also limited by we don't have MR elastography. Uh, so it, same thing as with your experience is we do ultrasounds for all of them. We're still in that, I would say, quality control phase for the elastography component because there's just so many variabilities of inspiration, expiration, changes, uh, age of the patient, uh, things like that. Um, but yeah, usually, uh, as Dr. Rachek mentioned, you know, if we see a nodule, we would go, we would go to an MR with EAVIST and then uh, go from there. Uh, Jack, I have one uh, last comment. Um, as you, you know, may recall, nearly 50 years ago, the grandparents of baby Kasdan contributed this endowment with the specific intent of bringing experts in the field uh, to our institution to help improve our understanding of congenital heart disease. Having met the family, uh, briefly one time, I may be the last person uh, that has done so. Uh, I am certain uh, that you're exactly what they had in mind uh, with this endowed professorship. And for them, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you. Kind of you to say that. Thank you.